Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's DFA Network-wide Expo. Can I get a yay? <laughs> I'm so glad to see everyone. It's, it's wonderful that you're all here. Thank you so much for joining us for this event. So today we are celebrating the conclusion of the fall 2020 term. And for many of us, this, the end of the year could not have uh, come sooner. Uh, but even though this year has been a little crazy, there has been so much things worth celebrating, especially in the DFA network. We have had over a hundred projects running this term across the entire DFA network, uh, supported by DFA alumni, supported by community partners, relationships were built, communities were impacted and design was uh, a really main staple for many of us this term in the middle of so much you know, confusion and, and, and worry that it's been a really great pleasure to be able to have this uh, community here for all of us to be a part of. And so I uh, am so grateful for the work that you've all done and I'm excited to learn a little bit more about all of the projects that you'll be presenting for us today. A little review of some Zoom norms for DFA calls. If you're able to have your video on, we would love to see everyone smiling and beautiful faces this morning. Uh, if you don't have the capacity to have your video on, that's okay, but we would love to see everyone. Uh, and let's do a Brady Bunch welcome. Wave to the person above you, wave to the person below you, you know, make some, some new friends. Perfect, it's so great to see everyone here this morning. Uh, we're also asking you to help us with a unique naming convention this morning. Uh, to change your name on Zoom, you go to your face on, in the Zoom you know, uh, field. There's three ellipses and you'll be able to go down to rename. We're asking everyone to rename themselves and add the emoji of, uh, to indicate if you're a dog or a cat person. And if you're looking, to, if you haven't used emojis, I didn't know how to do this uh, uh, for, for a very long time until this morning. Uh, but if you're looking to uh, add uh, uh, emojis and you're looking for the emoji keyboard on, on your, your Mac or Windows, for Mac, it's the control command spacebar option will bring it up when you're in the type field. And then for Windows, it's the Windows key and the semicolon. So let us know if you're a dog or a cat person by putting that emoji if you're able to bring that capability up um, for you. We're also going to be working in a feedback uh, a document that we've been working in for the previous Fritz and Expos. Uh, and that also contains the instructions for the, the Windows and Mac emoji keyboard. So please uh, pull up that. We're going to be using that when the teams are presenting. And that's where all of us will be able to give feedback and write our comments and, and celebrations and, and uh, suggestions as we move forward with uh, today's event. Um, and so uh, when we're in that moment, a quick uh, overview of what's happening today. This is an expo, so we have an extra special uh, uh, schedule uh, set up for everyone. During the first hour, we're gonna be going into two breakout rooms where teams are going to be uh, presenting their projects, the work that they've done this term to their respective groups. Um, and you'll be able to identify yourself uh, in those breakout groups based on uh, the color in the feedback room. So each person on the call and each team on the call has a uh, dedicated space for them to give feedback. If you're in breakout group one, you're in the orange breakout group columns. If you're in breakout group two, you're in the blue breakout room columns. And that's where you'll be giving feedback. So look for yourself or find your team header. And that's where you'll be writing the feedback for each of the teams that are presenting in your breakout group. We're gonna be hearing from six different teams from the DFA network today. We have DFA UIEC presenting their work um, with the Steelcase National Challenge on the future of work and social entrepreneurship. We're hearing from Fordham and supporting teachers. We're hearing from UT Austin and the Statues Project. We're gonna be hearing from RISD Brown on their voting project that they've been working on so uh, diligently during this election season. And we're gonna be hearing from Elon and improving mental health. And we're going to be hearing from one of the national project participants, UCSD and the Changemakers um, project that uh, they've been working on this term in collaboration with the YMCA. So that's going to be taking the first hour. We're about to enter some, some breakout groups and, and do that. When we regroup uh, after that first hour, we're going to come back together into this main room where everybody is located. And we're going to have a two-part play or two acts that we're excited to present to you, where we'll hear discussions from uh, and thoughts from uh, Adam Wheeler from Steelcase, 
as well as uh, two DFA alumni who are now at IBM, Izzy Kane and Ruby McCaffrey. Uh, McCaffrey, uh, Ruby, I'm, I'm, I don't have your last name up, but Ruby McCafferty, is that correct? Am I, am I having it right? Yes, 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 I think. Well, I'll introduce you better when we when we get to that moment of the presentation, but I'm so glad you're here. Yes, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's great. Okay. okay, great. It's a mouthful. Yes, after each of the presentations from Adam and Nizi and Ruby, we're going to be separating into uh, breakout groups so we can discuss what we, we hear today and then come back. So it'll be presentation, breakout group, presentation, breakout group, and then we'll end uh, with a larger uh, group discussion. So in the in the meantime, I just wanted to check in where we were uh, setting up. Does anyone have any questions or uh, comments for today's events? I see a lot of people here. And again, uh, can I get a big uh, excitement? Who's excited for today's expo? <laughs> Yes, let's get some physical Zoom reactions, some other Zoom reactions. Yeah, remember, you know, we have the emojis, we have our hands, we'd love to make, you know, noise and movement in your Zoom square so we can so support for people today. Um, Adam, uh, oh, excuse me, no, Alden, are we uh, all set? Yes, yeah, so our breakout rooms were less seamless than we wanted it to be. I, I think and hope that I've put you all in the right breakout rooms, but you're gonna have to bear with us for a minute or two as we make sure everyone's in the right place. So I have about everyone placed. Um, I'm gonna click through the breakout rooms, but Ross will be in the first one. Gloria and Rebecca will be in the second one. If people are misplaced, we'll switch people around quickly and then we'll, we'll rock and roll. So sorry about that, but let's, let's <laughs> see what happens is uh, important, but it is instead the people that conduct the work that will remain important at the end of the day. So um, our original how can we statement was a little broad. So we did some activities to, yeah. Um, so our original how can we statement was how can we activate and amplify change makers and companies for social impact. And so since it was this, since this statement was a little broad, we refined our focus and made the how can we statement a little bit more specific on um, man, uh, specific to management and um, employees. So on the next slide, um, we have, or we did some um, deconstruction of the how can we statement. So, which was more buzzwords. We broke those down to um, come up with words that were a little bit more specific to our focus. And um, on the next slide, we did another deconstruction of social impact because we still weren't a, really sure of what social impact really meant until um, like from our interviews. So we focused on, um, or we uh, looked into um, how to expand the general idea of social impact and what it really means for our project. And again, we looked into, or we're going to look into um, internal versus external impact. We uh, revisited that focus. Um, another focus that, or another insight that we got out of this exercise was um, employee and management driven uh, work. And um, we also found out that um, it would be a good idea to look for a designated team for uh, social projects. So looking off what you just said about redefining our focus, our statement, was we have three new focus points. So our first one, is uh, external versus internal impact and influence. And we chose to focus on encouraging external impact. So impact from outside the company or from outside the organization. And our second focus point was what guiding means in culture foundations, because each company, each organization has an existing workplace culture and how we can harness that existing culture to base a social impact plan. And our third focus is social impact via employees and how this is defined by the company. So you want to encourage employees and not just 
one person at the top to have such a change and to encourage social impact. Slide, please. So our three major pain points. Um, first one is inter-organizational communication, um, especially vertically. So from the managers to the employees, from like top level directors to employees and how they communicate across each other and opening up those channels of communication. Our second pain point was issues with efficiency, um, especially with COVID and working through Zoom and through emails. Um, remote communication is sometimes tough and working to make that uh, the best it can be, the most efficient it can be, even with COVID and remote working. Our third pain point is a more disconnected uh, employees. So like this quote says, some, some projects and some like work groups lack focus and lack goals and having that clear goal and clear focus really helps uh, employees forward. Okay, so next we wanted to um, move on to our design goals, uh, kind of like what where we're going next. Um, so we wanted to continue to reach out to companies, kind of try to find some community partnership, uh, and then uh, refine our interview process uh, to kind of redirect our uh, interviews now that we've kind of refined our uh, how can we statement. And we want to make a visual document uh, to kind of summarize our research points, findings, and key personas. So for our next steps and the next phase of work that we're going to do is to continue those interviews and understanding users. Uh, we want to continue to establish community partnerships and make sure that they're stable and they're willing to mentor us throughout this process. Um, start to identify some key personas, um, focusing on like specific groups, employers, employees, and what kind of markets that we want to focus on to kind of refine our focus. And then also continue to reach out to socially impactful companies that exist today that we can kind of learn from and hopefully receive a mentorship from even. And we thank you and we sincerely appreciate any feedback. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you, team. UIUC Future of Work. We have a couple minutes left for feedback, so I'd love to invite Adam from Steelcase to share some thoughts first. Uh, and then after that, for the rest of us, we're going to start a queue in the chat. Uh, if you want to share your feedback, just type your name in the chat and afterwards I'll call you one by one. Awesome. Thank you so much. I So there were a couple of things that I really liked. One was that you took a pretty vague starting statement. It's like it was full of so many words that who knows what they mean and you broke it down and made it more specific. And so you really did a good job of honing in and saying, and I couldn't remember what the specific slide was, but it was like, how can managers do X or Y or Z? So it's like you went from this big broad challenge to a specific pain point of how can managers do this? There was a, one of the things that I wish is you had also connected with like, well, there's this whole question of like, uh, the next generation needs, wants their work to feel more connected to purpose and meaning. Um, and I wish that that thread would have carried through. So it was like, that was an interesting tangent. Um, and it could have been interesting is to note that, oh, managers have this issue, employees have this issue, uh, comms teams have this, this issue or, or whatever. Um, and so what I wonder is in moving to the next steps, really, I feel like there's this point of like, how do you hone in on who you're solving for? And so it's like, if you know you're solving for managers, uh, and this, this problem resonates with them, then make that the focus of your, of your discovering your development work. If you know that you're solving for employees who need who are looking for meaningful engagements in their work, and uh, then the question is like, well, what would help them either identify or connect with a uh, to a job that is aligned with their purpose? And so, whatever the byproduct of your of your point of view is going to dictate where you go. And so that's what I wonder is like from from your team, what you've heard, where do you think you could have the most impact inside of an organization? Are you serving an organization's managers and that particular challenge? Or is your end user uh, somebody who's looking for their first job and wants to make sure it's aligned with their values? So that's just a couple of pieces of feedback. Yeah, Thank you so much. 
You're welcome to respond to that as well, Lauren, or anyone from Team UIUC if you want to. Uh, yeah, definitely. That has been um, a very big aspect of um, our, especially our in, in initial research with um, reaching out to employees because they were our first um, our first go-to in terms of interviews. Um, one thing we did realize was that, uh, and from our last project review, which happened not that long ago within our local UIUC group, um, was that we were actually asked um, whether or not we would be into, interested in looking into academic spaces because technically those are considered workspaces as well. And so the, um, the floor is still, it's still relatively open in terms of searching for stakeholders um, in that kind of sense. Um, because we were looking more towards the traditional employee when we were interviewing, uh, who works in a cubicle, who works uh, in front of a desk at an office somewhere in corporate land, in that kind of instance. Um, but yes, that has been a very big goal of ours to look into uh, pinpointing where exactly would it be um, the most beneficial to um, where they where they will feel the most impact. So thank you. Yes. Awesome. Um, I see that Heather also noted something that I want to talk about. It's just presentation wise and visually, I thought that your presentation was really great, especially when you were presenting your research and your insights. It was really clear and I could easily understand like the three different directions you were pulling yourself in. But I think Adam said it well in terms of like moving forward with your project, it would be really great to hone in on who exactly you're designing for. One thing I noticed is uh, your insights were so different, but at the same time, you're refined how can we focus on managers? Like your insights talked about space and then boundaries and then putting people first. How does that actually narrow down to your how can we? I think that choosing a specific audience will really help you go in one direction so that you can deep dive and really figure out what you want to then prototype and test um, rather than being pulled in all of these different you know really important topic areas but they're very separate all right we are just about at time so thank you so much team uiuc and if anyone else has feedback remember we have a notes doc that you can put all of that info in um, and I believe we have like a green room after this. So if you want to chat more with any of the teams, that's the space to do it in. So we're going to move on to team two, um, Fordham with supporting teachers. Okay, hi, can everyone see the screen? Okay. So we will be presenting on our final prototype co-designing final project with professor and students. So this is just our studio, just a picture of us. Um, our original topic was education supporting teachers and student autonomy. And our original how can we statement was, how can we provide teachers with the support to create more autonomy in the classroom? So after doing our research, we decided to change our how can we statement to how can we help teachers make assignments that reflect students' goals and interests. Um, part of the research, uh, and one interesting quote from our research was, teachers who adopted an autonomy-focused instruction style reported greater teacher motivation, efficacy, and well-being. So we, through our research, we came to three key insights. The first was that professors don't feel supported in transitioning to online schooling, especially at our school. There's one committee in charge of supporting professors and it's made up of professors who are already busy themselves. Um, our second key insight is that professors don't know how to use digital tools to create engaging lessons that promote autonomy. And also, there's a lot of um, tool fatigue, learning how to use these new different tools and also Zoom fatigue um, was something that a lot of people talked about. 
Um, and our third key insight is that online learning has decreased classroom connection and discussion opportunities. So going online, people have lost a lot of that spontaneous and natural connection um, just due to the nature of you know, calling on Zoom, sort of everything you say has to feel purposeful because you don't just talk, you unmute your mic and then you talk. So with all these insights in mind, uh, we decided for our pro final prototype to do a sort of digital flashcard format um, and basically just walks teachers through a suggested process for co-designing a project and it has suggested activities with a timeline. So some of the activities included in this timeline would be a poll for choosing topics based on interest, having students select a project type, um, so like a research paper or maybe an interview project or an art project based on their learning goals and what they want to improve on. And having the students ultimately work independently, but using Slack groups to increase motivation and student collaboration with kind of periodic check-ins like DFA has in their Slack. Um, so what we wanted to emphasize in this project was using student goals to guide learning. So for instance, students who are planning on going to grad school may want to improve their research skills by completing a research paper, whereas students who want to improve their public speaking skills might choose to do um, a project involving a presentation. So um, Hallie kind of wanted to walk through um, how this, this tool, this prototype um, may be used is uh, walking through a journey of one of our users. <laughs> this is Professor Albert Clarence, um, very classic, old, classy name. Um, he's an English professor. He's just teaching on Zoom for the first time and he's not great with tech, um, but a couple of his goals are just improving the class experience and increasing student engagement. Um, so kind of the first part of his journey is going to be contemplating new lesson plans um, that increase student autonomy and engagement and just brainstorming ways that he can improve the student's experience. Um, second part of his journey would be finding this tool, um, these digital flashcards and kind of a list of school resources. So if he was at our school at Fordham, he may find it on the Fordham website or be encouraged to use it by the administration. And then once he finds this, he is going to try to modify it, um, the timeline and activities to fit his needs in his specific class. And there may be specific suggestions on these flashcards or examples from past English classes um, that he can use to kind of encourage where he's gonna go with it. And then he's going to use the process to um, assign a final project to his English students. And in the end, the hope would be that the projects are then completed by the students using these um, interest and goal oriented projects um, along with kind of these groups that they're going to use for increased motivation and hopefully they will feel um, empowered and motivated by the end of it. Um, and this is kind of just an example of uh, our prototype. We kind of walked through it in another presentation that we did. Um, I think if we had more time and spent, you know, a couple, um, another month or so on this, we would have done a bit more visually to demonstrate like exactly what the flashcards and everything would look like. Um, but yeah, we, we walked through it kind of on a presentation process. And um, for the insight fulfillment, uh, at the end of this, this prototype offers a new project that can be used during online or in-person classes. Um, it shows a template of how to use the digital tools seamlessly and it doesn't introduce some new complicated technology that the professors or teachers would have to learn and it increases student connection and most importantly, increases student autonomy. And that is it. So any feedback would uh, be welcome.
Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Team Fordham. Um, you have seven minutes for feedback, so plenty of time. Um, everyone, feel free to start a queue in the chat so that we can go through feedback and people can share their comments seamlessly. Um, I can go first. So I really loved how you opened up the presentation with the problem statement and your insights and then jumping immediately to your prototype. I felt like for, uh, for where you are in the process, you were able to tell the whole story without losing a lot of that important information. Um, I learned a lot of what you learned from your research, so we didn't have to really go into those details. Um, but at the same time, I wish, I love the name Clarence, and I think lots of other people in our audience do too. Um, I personally wish he was a little more fleshed out. Like, what's his personality like? What are his values that influence the sort of journey that you were telling of how he was using your prototype? Um, I felt like the, the story, the journey that you told with Clarence using the uh, the prototype like uh, slides to create a new project for the students was very straightforward, but it wasn't as realistic that I think that it could have been because I didn't I couldn't tell like what was unique about Clarence. What are what are his struggles? Um, like I'm curious about if you learned any constraints that there are on the instructor's end that would maybe like be a roadblock for them just creating a uh, like a final project from your deck that maybe like interferes with any rules or regulations from the academic side. So those are my questions. Uh, yeah, and you're welcome to speak up, introduce yourself, respond to that if you want to. Um, all right, if not, Adam, we'll have you share your feedback. <laughs> Yeah, um, could you could you just restate your how can we your your updated how can we statement? Sure, it's um how can we help teachers make assignments that reflect uh, the students' unique goals and interests? Mm. So what I loved was that sort of like more specific reframe. So it's about like about helping teachers uh, make those assignments that more specifically reflect students' interests. Um, what I wonder is does this does the flashcard uh the flashcard sort sort of like solves this notion of like how do we acclimate a teacher who's intimidated by tech to make tech stuff more engaging but i wonder if there's an emotional that i could make tech stuff more engaging but that still might not be aligned with my learning with your learning goals as a student right and so i wonder if there's an opportunity to, to uh instead of solving on the professor's tech literacy, is there a way to make the more a more immediate connection between the student learner goals and what their lesson plan needs to be? Um, so I wasn't sure if this ended up putting like more responsibility on the professor as opposed to like a tool that might be useful for helping students surface and understand, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Oh, my professor knows this is what I'm trying to do. This thing allows my professor to I don't know, coach, coach his lessons in a way that more aligns with my goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we, we tried um, fine. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, you go first. <laughs> um, so what we were actually, if we had more time, we were considering doing sort of like a rubric kind of thing where students design the rubric and really like for a project to understand their learning goals and how it aligns with what they're doing. That was something we're in, we were interested in, but ultimately we didn't have enough time. And there were a few other ideas we were playing around with, um, but just in the interest of time, some of the ones that we came across later ended up being put to the wayside. Yeah, we, we, we wanted to make sure while we were doing it that uh, it wouldn't cause too much extra work for the teacher, like with this whole, with the concept of having people doing projects that are unique to their goals and interests, you can't have a, a class doing a billion different projects because the teacher has to then figure out how to grade that. Um, and that's more work as well. Um, and oh, to respond to Glory, I couldn't, couldn't unmute myself in time before, um, but 
yeah I was when we were doing the journey I was like maybe we should make it I, I kind of want to make it like a simpler version of like a persona but I think it definitely would have been better to include maybe like a real photo or I don't know consistent illustrations and more details about him so I think that was yeah very helpful feedback to just make it more detailed and show like all the challenges in the journey. Yeah, I think it's fine to keep it simple but maybe one thing that you could add on is just like a thought bubble of what he's thinking about that's not mm -hmm. just like explaining his process but like oh this is Albert's voice and I can hear you know what he's thinking. Mm -hmm. um, next up Alden for feedback. <laughs> I lost my mouse. Um, cool. Yeah, thanks all. Uh, I just wanted to start out with, yeah, I think that this is a really interesting and important topic about thinking about, yeah, how do we create um, spaces, maybe in person, but also digitally where students are, there's, you're setting up a dynamic where um, everyone is sort of doing some co-designing and um, creating agency and voice and room for themselves in the classroom. I think that's a really exciting and important topic. I was interested in, um, yeah, again, about the contextually and the idea I'm really excited about. Again, I, I wonder a little bit about the feasibility and like what impetus and sort of workload it puts on the teacher and wondering if uh, about what some of the research you all did and like who you, if you were able to talk to professors and teachers or came across anyone who had been doing similar work and what, um, how it changed the sort of like classroom dynamic um so yeah wondering if you all had uh wondering more about that process and then also and i think you kind of answered this but i was curious about um if you were going to continue on with this project what the next steps would be um so to answer one of your questions our community partner actually was in is in charge of this you know, professor led kind of committee that's supporting um, teachers and moving online. Um, and some of the things she's tried included just like, I can't remember exactly what, but she does a lot of kind of like co-design sort of things with her students where students are encouraged to influence the syllabus and what they're learning. Um, and that influenced us a lot because knowing that a professor was already like doing these kinds of things and interested in this sort of topic encouraged us to go in this direction. And to answer your other question about like going forward, <laughs> um, we felt like at the end of it that we realized that we spent like too much time, I think, on like the research and ideation. And there were almost just too many ideas at the end that even like with this idea that we ended up with, we still feel like it could have been more specific like in one of our last meetings, we we're like, oh, we, we, we could have actually designed this or this or this tool that like are, you know, a part of this thing. And I think if we if we spent more time on it, we would have liked to have gotten more specific, maybe designing that rubric thing or something more to do with forming student groups or something like that. Um, so. Thanks all. All right, we are at time. Izzy, I hope you can speak first for our next team. Um, but thank you so much, Team Fordham, and we're going to move on to our final presentation of the day, UT Austin. Thanks so much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see this? Mm -hmm. So we're UT Austin, and we're presenting on how to reimagine historical monuments on campus. So uh, the UT Main Mall, the area directly in front of the UT Tower, is arguably the most important location on campus. It's a major walkway for the students and faculty, which is why the location and subsequent removal of the six Confederate era statues, such as Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, and Woodrow Wilson, is so incredibly important. And the question of what to do with these empty spaces remains. One of our interviewees this semester described the pedestals where the statues used to be as empty holes. So something can and should be done here to finish the work that was started. So our statues project started last semester. We conducted preliminary stakeholder research to gain a feeling 
for what students and other stakeholders want out of the space. And we outlined a call for artists that we iterated upon this semester. We met with UT administration, but then we identified a need for more research. And so this is our existing prototype. Um, we called for art installations to be installed in each of the six spaces representing the university's core values. We outlined broad entry requirements and a selection committee comprised of UT students, faculty, and staff. Um, and with that said, I'll leave it to Brahadi to discuss the research that we did further this semester. Alrighty, thank you, Shri. So to become more informed on the varying viewpoints of this issue, we reached out to three major groups of stakeholders, Black student leaders on campus, faculty members, and a few members of the organization, the Sons of Confederate Veterans. So our research consisted of Zoom interviews where we spoke to the stakeholders directly to gain a better understanding of their perspectives while also testing our prototype from last semester. So through this process, our goal was to create a research informed solution that takes into account the sentiments of all the people involved and really empathize with them. And this in turn helped us get creative with ideating a solution that benefits everybody. So based off of the information that we gathered, we could see that the members of the Sons of Confederate Veterans that we spoke to wanted to reinstall the statues because it represents their heritage as Texans. And the UT faculty we talked to were more of a middle ground. They wanted to find a way to keep the statues but educate people about the underlying racist sentiments as a way to keep both parties on either end of the spectrum happy. And the black stakeholders we spoke to believe that the prototype from last semester was a good start, but we needed to find a way to clearly educate people about equity and inclusion and not just put up the installations as a way to appease the black community. And essentially what we were able to see was that there were very conflicting viewpoints on this issue and we were faced with the question, how can we create a solution that acknowledges the history while simultaneously looking towards the future and helping UT grow into a more safe and inclusive space? So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Shri again, who will be defining the problem that we gleaned through our research. Yeah, through all of our synthesis, we basically came up with three how might we questions that would further inform our design. So how might we spur UT to be an inclusive campus for all students? How might we create a sense of closure for students? And how might we create and inspire conversations on campus? Through these how might we questions, we um, came up with some design criteria that Vani will go into next. Thank you, Shree. So in response to the how might we questions that Shree just talked about, we created these design criteria. We got to these by pulling quotes and ideas from interviews and research we conducted that Brahadi explained earlier. The design criteria we came up with were that our design must incite conversation, acknowledge the history of the stakeholders, and prioritize inclusivity. This then led us to the ideation phase. The first part of the ideation phase is rapid ideation. We brainstormed ideas for each of the design criteria we created in the previous phase, as you can see in the mural document on the slide. We then developed those ideas and sent them to our stakeholders to receive feedback. The individual ideas we narrowed it down to were on the slide as following. And now some of these ideas may seem like the obvious answers. However, some of them go against the design criteria we created. For example, we thought of keeping the original prototype that she mentioned, but we felt like it left many people out of the conversation by not having a diverse selection committee, not prioritizing the stakeholders history, as well as the idea of building a community. These are all issues that were addressed in our prototype that Chris will now talk about. Thanks, Vani. So I'm just gonna click on a link real quick that'll take you to our prototype. Basically with all this feedback in mind, we wanted to create a design competition. So what you're seeing here is basically an informational packet that artists would be able to view and understand uh, what they need to submit in order to have a chance at having their design implemented on campus. So we'll run through some of the parts real quick for you. First is just an introduction of what the design competition is, followed by a description of what DFA is, as well as a potential uh, sponsorship and partnership. We're working with Landmarks, which is a public artworks commission on campus. Um, after the participants section, you have a section designed for submission teams and requirements there. Uh, timeline overview, which is roughly a semester long, so it should work out well. Uh, design criteria adapted from our own project uh, just to the context of this design competition. Uh, after this description, you have a section for location importance of the space, which is basically the history that Shri described earlier, followed by budget, description of judges committee, which is also clear important, not just for who's submitting, but also who's determining what is good. And then finally, submission requirements and evaluation criteria for how a winner will actually be selected. Shri's gonna jump back to the PowerPoint real quick and we'll talk through some of these things in a little more detail. 
First, we have our theme. Uh, this is clearly important. This is kind of the combination of all our design uh, criteria that we bring together um, in one powerful sentence in order to guide artists throughout their uh, design submission. Next, we have uh, design criteria. So you have these three different things here that should look familiar. These are simply adapted to the context of this competition uh, that go beyond simply um, just what we created earlier. Next, we have um, requirements for submission teams. We want to have individuals and teams um, just because both provide different pros and cons, um, either promoting inclusivity, but also as well as making things individual so that we don't reduce the amount of submissions. Next, we have the selection committee, which also is very important, not just um, who is submitting, but also who's determining what. So we want to make sure that this comes from all areas of campus, as well as different races, ethnicities, backgrounds, uh, et cetera. Finally, uh, we have the evaluation criteria, which is how each project will be judged. Um, here you can see it's basically our design criteria adapted in a way that can judge a project uh, a little more qualitatively and quantitatively. And finally, I'm gonna pass it off here to Jackie to talk about some of the feedback we've received in this prototype so far. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so I'll be hitting on some of the main feedback points that all of us have received so the first one is funding ambiguity and is mainly about how we will fund the ongoing expenses of this project. The second one is clarity on creators and whether or not they will be in teams or done individually, as well as how many of those vacant spaces will be assigned to each of those teams. Expanding the project is thinking about how we will extend to the general UT administration past the selection committee. The two types of criteria we found that we must develop is how we will be selecting the selection committee as well as how we will select the design submissions. And finally, the last one is frequency, which deals with whether or not the design competition will be through temporary installments or more concrete ones. These are all the things that we had to define and reiterate within our project to, in order to update our prototype accordingly. And finally, I'll pass it off to Shri to conclude our presentation. Thanks, Jackie. So this is all the hard work that we put in all semester. So um, I'll open it up now to any questions. Wow, oh, thank you so much, Team UT Austin. That was really, really in depth and I'm excited to hear all the feedback. We have about six minutes. Um, so I'd love to invite Izzy to speak first. Thank you. Um, that was an excellent presentation. I'm astonished by how much information you guys jammed in there, but it was really easy to follow. Your slides were super clear and well designed and everything was super easy for me to follow and understand, especially being the first time seeing this, um, this project. So well done on your presentation. I thought you guys killed it. Um, just a couple uh, pieces of feedback. I don't have a lot of questions, but I wish I saw a little bit more of your process documentation and your presentation. I know you guys had a lot of information to cover in that short amount of time, but I think um, allowing me to see like your process and your decision making and you know why you were taking certain steps would have been great for me to see as a member of the audience. And then lastly, um, I'm just curious to see like your next steps. I know you guys got all that great feedback on your um, your prototype, but I would have liked to hear some more next steps if you plan doing, you know, implementations of that feedback. If you guys plan on talking to more, you know, faculty members, whatever it is. But um, overall, really, really good job. I'm very impressed. Um, Team UT, you're totally welcome to introduce yourself, respond to Izzy's comments. Yeah, I can speak about that briefly. Um, thanks, Izzy, for that feedback. Really appreciate it. But our next steps are, um, I mentioned landmarks. That is uh, one of the top three public artworks commission actually in the country at a university. Uh, we got the chance to speak with the director of that last week. And she advised us to make sure we reevaluate our, re our process to make sure it is the right one that we truly want a design competition. Um, and she's going to help us establish some more relationships, especially with faculty and administration on campus to make sure we're talking to the right stakeholders in order to assess that we're making the right decision there. So probably jumping back in a little bit more interviews there to reassess our process, which, you know, obviously affects our, our final prototype. So that's probably the immediate next steps we're looking into. Awesome. Um, Liz from Fordham, would you like to share your comments? Sure. Um... They're all good things. <laughs> um, I just was saying that I really liked the presentation. Um, I feel like it was a really detailed and like well balanced with just like showing us the before. I really like that you showed us some of your top ideas from the ideation because I feel like I don't always see that. But you even mentioned like why some of them like wouldn't work. Um, 
and yeah, the, the prototype, what you walked us through it really quickly, but like with detail and the feedback was good. So yeah, I don't have anything negative to, to say, but <laughs> good job. Yeah. Um, bouncing off that, I thought your presentation, like, uh, like Izzy said, was just so packed full of process and information. I think one way that you can get all of like those important points that you shared, but also speak to some of that process is maybe as you were talking about your insights or your research, just like in the corner list, how many interviews you did, how many people you talked to, like what kinds of research, just like three bullet points so that they're there and we can see them on the screen, but you don't have to like verbally talk about it. Um, yeah, I thought your presentation was really beautiful. Um, I think it's it's such an important topic and a, and a complicated topic to work through and try to like appease all the different stakeholders in this. Um, I'm just curious if there's any like exhibition or like art committee on your campus that you can also speak with in terms of like installing artwork. Um, and then maybe the last thing, questions is just something I'm curious about is like, maybe it's not a competition, more just like a series of art proposals that are put up around by everyone who wants to participate in that way. You know, everyone gets their voice heard, you know, uh, and seen on campus. So that's all I have to say. Anyone else? We still have like a minute and a half for feedback. I'll, I'll share maybe quickly. One of the, the things I really appreciated was the, your, your very specific design criteria and then how that was directly engaged to the stake, like directly related to the needs of your stakeholders. And I think sometimes that doesn't happen or it can feel disconnected, but I thought the way that you presented and articulated that was like, oh yeah, this is what it needs to do. And I think setting those boundaries is so important anytime you have a design project. It, I really appreciated that upfront because then that sort of, you know what success needs to look like. And if it doesn't meet that criteria, you know, you've got some work to do. I also, uh, one of my wonderings was, uh, and this is, this is different than like um, a, a long-term installation in the space is, I wonder if there's a way to emphasize the absence as a way to acknowledge and honor the tension of the middle space that we're in. Like, what could there be an interesting, I don't know, like what kind of negative space surrounding it might help hold the tension that like this is not resolved or just be at least being a tribute to the, it, the issue not being resolved. Yeah, I love that. It sort of speaks to like while you're working towards an ideal future, you also have room to address something immediately for like the day to day of while you're working through this project. Um, all right, so that's time. Uh, thank you so much to all of our teams. Let's do some snaps for Team UT Austin, Team Fordham, uh, Team UIUC. Our schedule is a little bit shifted, so um, we're going to do a group photo first and then go on break, come back at 11.10 uh, for Adam's first lightning talk and then the next two acts that we have. So I would love if everyone can unmute yourselves and then get ready to move your hands in the air so we can do a quick photo. On the count of three, uh, we're all gonna say DFA. <laughs> are, we, are we doing this with our hands too? Yeah, just, you know, do some jazz hands. Um, okay, on the count of three, uh, one, two, three, DFA. DFA. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, so stay on this call. You feel free to mute yourself, turn off your video. We'll come back at 11.10. Hello, everyone. Um, we're the Increasing Voter and Civic Engagement Team. And this is our beautiful team. Everyone has voted on our team, except for me, who is international student. Hopefully, everyone in the audience who are eligible to vote has voted, especially those that have been to our midterm grid. <laughs> And here's a brief timeline of what we've done this semester. And I'll hand it off to Alex to talk about what we've done before the election. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, so prior to the election, we really, or just when this term started, we really had to hit the ground running. So before the election, we focused on a lot of actionable ideas that um, we could put out there. And we used two formats, social media and public art. So digital and physical. And our goal is to generate an atmosphere of active participation in the election, but also while also learning about how to generate effective engagement as a team. Um, the next slide. And uh, we did that through a lot of different um, forms as well. So on the social media side, we created like memes. We had an Instagram account called Meme Ballot. Um, and we just hit on a lot of different interests of college students. So things like drag queens and Among Us. Um, and we also use our Instagram to get interaction by through questions. Another thing we did uh, on the public art side is we created uh, a box that said one in 2020 makes you vote and we put it around places on campus, uh, around the Brown campus mainly. Uh, and you can see a couple of the sample responses on the right there. Um, and then in addition, we created a digital companion uh, that asked the same question people could write in basically a tweet length uh, response. And you can see the the word cloud graphic there on the bottom left is a combination of the digital responses that we got on the website, uh, as well as the, the paper responses from the physical location. Uh, and if you, it's a little small, but if you visit uh, voicesofvoters.org, you can see the, the large image from all our submissions. And what we've learned through these quick action within the month before election includes what it takes to build traction on social media, what are the effective forms of engagement and how phrasing of the prompts could make a difference, and what it takes to work with a short time frame as current event shifts. And moving on to post-election. While we focus on rapid ideation and content creation before the election, we took some time to reset afterwards. We generated some how might we statement, seeing how the political landscape has become more and more polarized because of social media. Our primary focus is on breaking the echo chamber, including facilitating conversation and cultivating empathy across political views. Other questions are informed by responses, reactions, and observation to our pre-election work, such as create, um, thinking about creating a self-sustaining platform where other users can contribute to its content. And we are also still interested in integrating physical element to our digital plans, noticing that our box, for example, sparked a lot of curiosity. And our overarching goal is to encourage civic engagement after the election since um, all, once all the hype has gone, um, we want to continue that momentum. Yeah, so in response to our how I meet state statements and observations from our pre-election phase, as a team, we developed user profiles um, centered around college age voters and users that address people across the spectrum of civic engagement. Um, from those who are completely complacent to those who are very active in within their own bubbles, um, we consider what type of users are more or less likely to engage with political uh, content on digital or physical platforms and how might they respond to opposing views. Um, so utilizing keywords and phrases that would frame their potential interactions um, with our platforms and other platforms, we aim to understand how their echo chambers might impact individual users with different engagement patterns. So as a response to our, like all our user profiles, we decided to, well, introducing Don't Mind the Gap, which is um, basically a web space um, that allows all our user profiles to kind of interact with each other and essentially provide them a space to tell their own personal story. As you can see in our little um, line underneath of bringing the person into politics, dismantling polarization one story at a time. That's essentially like our motto is what we're trying to do for all our user profiles and trying to give them a space. Um, our mission statement there is a platform for people to share the stories that shape their political stances, uh, essentially breaking the echo chamber and, you know, um, bringing the two sides, the bipartisan, like, part, political party sides together and develop more empathy for the other side instead of, like, hate or instead of, like, arguments. Um, and where we're planning to do this is do it on a Facebook page, a website, and a Reddit. 
because those are like the most politically active kind of spaces that we um, were able to kind of reduce down amongst the plethora of like places that we can be in. Um, and then our colors, um, we're using purple because purple is the color that kind of lives in between the gap. We have a red party and a blue party, like a red state and a blue state. So in between those two lies purple and we're using that to kind of basically create um, like a neutral space for people to kind of come and share their views and kind of share their personal story. And the neutral stance is kind of depicted through our entire visual system by using purple everywhere to ease the viewer into a safe space that we aim to kind of create. Yeah, so for the stories that we um, will collect, we wanted the narratives to respond to the specific question, what was a personal experience that made you take a specific political stance? Um, and although we do want the writers to be transparent about their experiences, um, the conditions that we set for the stories is that they are strictly personal, um, just to discourage the generalization of a community. Um, and the level of anonymity is determined by how comfortable the writer is with sharing. Um, although including information that is relevant and impactful to their personal story is encouraged. Um, they'll have full ownership of their stories, which is disclosed on the Google form that we plan on sending out or that we've set up for the story submissions. And as a team, we've already went through rounds of collecting stories from people around us to prepare for initial content for our archives. And just as to expand our project, we plan on diversifying the platforms that we use to collect these stories, as well as reach out to strangers who have already, who've already vocalized their political views under other content. So currently we're in the iterating stage of creating the website. And at the moment, we're really thinking about taking kind of a modular format where we display the stories and then you can filter the stories based on certain political views or um, certain, uh, you know, for example, like about climate change or gun control. Um, and then other components of the website we're exploring are creating an educational component where we can kind of unpack why there is this polarization and point people to certain educational resources or uh, videos that can kind of uh, talk about this. Um, the other thing we were thinking of doing is creating a statistics platform that could perhaps track uh, where people are getting their news sources and how those are informing their political or personal stories. And then the final part would be a place to submit their story um, on the website. So another element that we're considering uh, moving forward after the election, we're, um, we have access to, with, through a partner from RISD, to 11 electrical boxes on College Hill, um, as you can see in the top uh, right corner of our slide. So we were hoping that this is this would be an opportunity for us to really focus on local issues and put them on the forefront of the physical environment. Um, so right now we've outlined just like two very simple concepts, one being gentrification and one being uh, sea level in year. Uh, so we want to create captive graphics on the front that are also that adds some sort of aesthetic uh, value to the landscape and then have more information on the back. And we are also planning on perhaps partnering with local organizations to help us paint these. Um, and although this is not say like a sustainable solution, uh, it would definitely help keep us motivated as we go through the slower process of developing a website. And our next steps for Don't Mind the Gap are to collect more stories. We'll be sharing a QR code with you shortly um, if you want to help us out and to publish a Facebook page and a subreddit before um, publishing our website. And for our electrical boxes, we want to propose our ideas with our partner. Again, these would all be local issues and um, generate more specific designs over winter break and then start painting at the beginning of next semester, weather permitting, of course. And the feedback we're looking for is um, how would you be interested in following Don't Mind the Gap? How can we make our platform more effective? Um, how can we garner engagement with our platform and suggestions for collecting our story submissions, moderating comments, and managing a Facebook or subreddit page? And these are also um, copied on our uh, Google Drive. And thank you so much. This is the QR code that links uh, you to share your story. And we'd also love feedback on that uh, Google submission form. So please check it out regardless of whether you plan on submitting a story. Thank you. Dean, um, I think at least one of your presentations before about this, and I um, really love the way that you all have continued to work on this and just evolve your process over time. I think that 
um, also like with your presentation of all of this, you did a really good job of showing kind of your like iterative and like cyclical process. Um, it was fantastic. I think um, I don't really have a lot of feedback in terms of, you know, what you've already done, but if we're thinking about kind of moving into the future, something that I would love to see more of is partnership with, you know, community organizations and like that kind of thing. I think there are a lot of people that are doing work that is similar to this. And I think that you can only be made stronger by like partnering with, you know, whether it's other organizations, you know, every year Brown or um, other organizations like in Providence, I know that there are just a lot of, you know, smart people, a lot of civically minded people out there. Um, so I think that that would be a really amazing thing for you all to work on and think about is kind of, you know, putting some feelers out and seeing who else is, is doing something like that. And I think that will also help you with, you know, engagement in the platform and, you know, thinking about those, that like electrical box idea, like the issues that you might tackle there. So, but fantastic work. It's great to see this project like, evolve over the course of the semester. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Carla, I want to uh, put you on the spot if, if that's okay. I know uh, if you could introduce yourself as well, we're glad you're, you're here and I would love to know your thoughts about this project. Hi everybody, my name is uh, Carla Seaton Macedo and I was part of the Vote Like a Woman group. Uh, we sort of uh, took this time of 2020 to sort of push people out to vote and more importantly to just uh, generally inform voters and power voters and so this project you know speaks to my heart and soul um, because we were really trying to mobilize uh, the sort of woman voters this year and so I would say that one of the things that really stood out to me you know much like what Ruby said was this uh, ability to connect a lot of people that are already on the ground getting stuff done to the sort of people that are just sort of newly awakened by uh, you know, this sort of voting season. So um, I would say three things that stood out to me. Um, the recognition of the echo chamber is really important because we're so used to and comfortable in our circles. So to really push people to think outside of their sort of normal comfort zone, uh, the local partnerships, uh, super key. And then uh, to sort of bring it back to the graphic and sort of branding aspect, I think you guys did a great job of uh, honing in on a narrative um, that, you know, is really about unity and, and, and uh, making sure that we sort of get to know other people on the other side of the spectrum. Um, that said, I think that the key for me of, of where you guys can really push this project is how do we connect more people with different points of view? Um, and in the instance where you guys are sharing that the I don't remember the name of the platform, I'm, I'm blanking here, sorry. Um, but the ability to share sort of where facts are coming from, I think is something that could be great to highlight. Um, what is your news source? Question your news source always. And then from there, um, that maybe is the next connection to connecting uh, organizations that can help uh, with what you're passionate about. So great job, everybody. I hope that that's enough uh, feedback, but if not, feel free to reach out whenever. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, any last one, two second comments to, to send off the team? Okay, with that, congratulations to uh, DFA RISD Brown. Thank you so much, Jack, for, for being here. Congratulations. Please pass along to the rest of the team, and we'll be sending them this feedback shortly. Up hey, next, thanks. we are going to be having a presentation from uh, the DFA Elon Improving Mental Health team. So. Team, feel free to share your screen and take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Ross. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see? Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. We are DFA Elon. Today, we'll be talking about our project focused on supporting mental health of high school students. My name is Michaela Ford, and I'm a communication design major. I'm Kate, I'm a senior at Elon, and I'm also a communication design major. Hi, I'm Orlando, I'm a junior, and I'm an engineering major. So the issue that we are focusing on for our project was mental health. 
So one stat that we pulled just to really summarize this issue is that in the US, one in six youth aged 16, six to 17 year old experiences a mental health disorder each year. And that was in 2019. When you factor in a global pandemic, more challenges emerge. Some of the challenges that students face today are changes in their routine, break in the continuity of learning, missed significant life events, example, graduation, loss of security, loss of safety in terms of their health. So COVID has um, presented a lot of new challenges for students already dealing with mental health issues. So who is this issue affecting? I want you to meet Gracie. Gracie is a 15 year old sophomore in high school from Graham, North Carolina. And she lives with her two parents and younger brother. She's part of Elon Academy, which is a program that supports high school students with their transition to college. She enjoys you know, going to school, hanging out with her friends, playing volleyball, keeping up with the latest TikTok trends. Um, she's very loud, not going around her close friends, but can also be really shy when meeting new people. Some goals of her, she hopes to get accepted into her dream college, but wants to find a support system that will better help her accomplish this. She's grateful for Elon Academy and knows her parents stand by her, but doesn't really know how to talk with her counselors about her concerns. She sometimes feels lost at school and anxious about her future plans. And she also has trouble talking with her close friends about her mental health. Um, so some frustrations too. Gracie has also been frustrated by this remote learning due to COVID-19. She misses seeing her friends every day. She has also had, you know, trouble staying attentive in class and worries about how her grades this semester are gonna impact her future goals. Um, and then I also pulled a quote from her. So she said, I don't really like talking to my friends about my feelings because they sometimes make it about themselves. When I say I'm having a bad day, my friends will disregard that and say they are too. Um, so with Gracie, we want to now kind of share a few insights we found, um, so. Yeah, so throughout the process, um, one of the insights that we found was that youth mental health is worsening. So in 2020, um, as of currently right now, 9.7% uh, of the youth in the US uh, are, are suffering or have suffered from severe depression compared to 9.2% from last year. And where it may, where it may come from, um, it may come from probably like family background, social media, or more um, related to like personal issues of that sort. So the second insight we found, we actually pulled from an interview we did and I, I put in a little partial, a part of the quote, but one of our interviewees said, since we've been, she's a sophomore in high school too, sorry. She said, since we've been fully online with school, I found the work easier, but it's harder to do. Myself with a lot of other people I know have had a hard time gathering motivation to actually do the work or go to class just because it gets so draining to sit in your room all day staring at a screen. School is just emotionally draining and my mental health is definitely a lot worse than how it was when we were in school physically. It's also hard not being able to go places with friends and not really being able to see a lot of people. She said, I also know a lot more people have just stopped being friends completely with other people because they can't see them. So that is our second insight. COVID is clearly not helping the situation. I know we've probably all felt stressors of COVID one way or another. And as Michaela mentioned it before, um, high school students are especially feeling this. Um, stress levels have increased for high school students during the pandemic and you know, students being stuck at home um, is causing them to lack valuable social interactions and connect with others. Um, and even Gracie, our persona I mentioned earlier, expressed how she's worried about the impact of COVID and kind of how it'll impact her future plans and ambitions. Um, so where, where does this lead? leave high school students feeling? It's leaving them feeling more isolated, anxious, and kind of fearful than before COVID. 
And then our third insight came from the quote that we pulled that says, I'm not sure my, I'm sure my high school has a program, but I'm also not sure there is one because it was never publicized. So from this quote, we gathered the insight of the fact that most schools have programs and services that support mental health of students. So not all, but most schools have these programs. And then if you disregard the effectiveness of the programs um, that they offer, like looking beyond that, just what programs and what schools and what institutions have these things available, there are a lot of them. Um, so what does this mean for us? It means that there's an opportunity to work with existing structures instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. So working with programs and services that already have something in place instead of trying to create an entirely new service um, from scratch. So from that, it's time to revise current programs and practices that support mental health. So revise was a key word here because as we said before in our insight, a lot of schools and a lot of programs already have things in place, but now that we're living in a time of COVID, how can we revise these current practices to support mental health? And that goes right directly into our, how can we statement that we've reframed. So again, I'll read it. How can we revise current pro programs and practices that support mental health? And with this, this led us to our community partner. Yeah, so we partner with Elon Academy and a little uh, background of Elon Academy. So Elon Academy is a nonprofit college access and success program for high school students. Um, it utilizes near uh, peer mentoring models. And um, it'll be, so Elon Academy would be, is a great partnership for us because they already have mental practices in place that give us the opportunity to do research and improve these practices that they already have in place. And conducting, yeah. and conducting more research. Yeah, so just to add on to that, uh, Elon Academy works with high school students and they value a lot of academia and that kind of thing. So when we were forging this partnership, one thing that we had to do was really make it a mutually beneficial relationship. So Elon Academy really values research over solutionism. And as part of DFA, we really wanted to create something and um, build a prototype. So from that, we have our deliverable that we've been working on, which is a research guide for Elon Academy, um, which is a literary analysis focusing on the role of peer mentoring. So that near peer model, um, just having mentors for students who are close to their age, so close to the age of the students, um, help in supporting mental health. So providing them this research guide that gives them that information, but then also with recommendations from that information that um, we could implement on our end um, and then give off to them. So that's sort of how the two sides came together from Elon Academy really just wanting that academic, that research, um, but then also us being able to deliver them something in the form of this research guide with recommendations. So some questions that we have for you going forward. Yeah, we're just obviously very eager to hear your feedback about the information that we've had so far and going forward. So I wanna leave you guys with these questions being, how should we approach creating a deliverable, deliverable without being able to interview Elon Academy students? So that we didn't really mention before, but that is another issue kind of that we've run into where Elon Academy doesn't want us to interview current students to gather insights from them. So a lot of the insights we pulled were based off our own interviews of high school students that we all know personally. Um, so knowing that we can't interview the students that are currently enrolled in the program, like, do you think that we can still create this deliverable successfully? And then the second question is, do you think that a guide is a successful way to deliver research to our community partner for this implementation. So yeah. And that is all we have. Thank you. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much, DFA Elon. A big round of virtual applause and physical applause for, for this awesome presentation. Uh, I'm going to put the Elon feedback queue in, whoops, I don't know. I accidentally put the list of teams, but the Elon feedback queue uh, is in the chat. So we'd love to open it up for discussion, starting with Aileen. Hi, guys. Um, I think you did a, a great job. I, I loved your the, the specificity, I guess I would say, and the depth of your user story. Um, and the fact that you were able to interview so many people and that you were able to derive so many insights from your interviews. Um, I like that a lot. One thing I wanted to caution you about, um, one of your insights was that 
mental health is worsening um, in youth over time. And I'm wondering um, if some of that is due to the fact that not necessarily that it's getting worse, although I wouldn't be so surprised that it were, but that more people are comfortable talking about it. And that is why the data shows that it's going up because when I was in high school and suffering from depression, no one talked about it. And you couldn't have been blamed for thinking that no one suffered from it. Um, so, you know, I think that as, as people like you who are doing um, projects and research on this or encouraging people to come forward, that those numbers are going to go up. So you want to make sure that your insights are separating cause and effect. Um, I do wonder how you're going to do this research guide a little bit. Um, I love the idea of you trying to bridge, you know, your needs as designers with those of the Elon Academy as researchers. Um, but I'm wondering if you could effectively provide them with a research guide that, that they didn't already have the means to acquire on their own um, because you're not able to interview any of their students. So I, I will say that I'm not sure I think that that is the best use of your time as a deliverable um, and that it's possible that, um, you know, I think that at some point you were on along the lines of going towards destigmatization and, and encouraging students to be able to better talk about their mental health and encouraging their friends to be able to, to be more accepting of hearing that. And based on your user story of your friend, of the, no, sorry, not of your friend, but of the person who said her friends, she couldn't talk to them because they sort of dismissed what she said. And, oh yeah, I'm having a bad day too. Um, I wonder if that's a, another direction that you could go in that might be helpful. But I, I love that you're pursuing this at all. And, um, and I think that you did a lot of great research. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, team, I'm happy to respond if you have any other uh, re feed or re anything, any reactions to any feedback too. I wanted to offer uh, some, oh, oh, Ruby, go for it. You can, you can go, it's okay. Yeah, I, I really appreciated uh, I'll, I'll echoing a lot of uh, Eileen's praise, your specificity and, and focus. And I was wondering though, when in the insights, like one of which was a recognition that in the before times, students didn't really know about the, the mental health uh, institutions uh, that are resources that were available to them on Canvas um, or on campus. And I was wondering, you know, what there was this, this, or I got, I don't think this was spoken, but like getting uh, to the before, like what does it look like post COVID and how to avoid, you know, having the same situation where normal people didn't know before and, and how, like, what does it look like in response to COVID? But once like, F, like in a year when people are starting to not be in the same mindset of COVID fear or just reaction to COVID, how to avoid going back to that, um, when COVID isn't the main stressor, going and falling into similar patterns of people still not knowing about the resources they have on campus. So like, how can COVID be a, a, a getting out of that groove uh, moving forward? I don't know if that's a question, but just an offering that I, I wanted to pose to you all. Uh, and then Ruby, if you want to round us out. <laughs> yeah, I think that just two quick things, I think in terms of your um, issue, like contacting current students, that's like definitely a, a huge hurdle to get over. But I think that there are a lot of different ways that you can go about engaging with people. I think your work to talk with, you know, high school students that you know is really great. I would also suggest um, trying to talk to like current teachers and like guidance counselors, because I think that those people will have a lot of expertise just about like maybe the structural side of things. Um, also like past students might be helpful in this case. Um, and then, yeah, I think just to echo what Eileen said, I think that there, there was kind of like two different themes that you were exploring. And I think that this is a fantastic time for you all to go back and do some reflection and just kind of, you know, maybe take all of this information that you've learned and go back and do some more ideation or some mapping or things like that, just to kind of figure out like, a little bit more what the root cause of everything is because I think that getting information is definitely a big part of it but I think this is also a good time to you know try to think about how you might be a little bit more um, inventive and in getting students to engage with one another um, and setting up like I don't know there are a lot of things that you can do but I think that it's a good time to just pause and reflect 
Um, and that's not necessarily detrimental to your project at all. It might help you a lot. So fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you again so much, DFA Elon. Uh, up next, we're going to be hearing from the DFA UCSD team. And, and Junhee, uh, is Brandon on the call? Is he just in the other room? Did we put him in the wrong one? I think he's in the waiting room, but I, I'm not sure if the host is, uh, is checking the waiting room right now. OK, great. I will do that. If you want to get started, I'll, I'll, I'll pull him in here as soon as possible. OK. Should I, should I play the video? or? Are you able to play it? Um, yes. It, I'm just uh, just gonna turn off some some notifications really quickly. Appreciate that. Um, for context, yes, the YMCA Expo was yesterday. So the team, this is their second time presenting to a crowd in in this week, um, and they're looking for uh, you know just to share out the work that they've done and, and happy to get it in front of. Uh, other people who aren't part of the YMCA project. So whenever you're ready. Right, I think I'm, I'm ready. Um, let me share my screen. recording. Can everybody see my screen? Awesome. Um, right. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jun He, and my team and I have been working on the DFA YMCA Changemakers program, and our concept is called the Changemakers. Before we get started, I just want to thank Ross, Alden, Nicholas, DFA National, members of our YMCA partner, Derek, Maddie, and the youth and government groups, as well as our mentor, Suzanne. We would not have been able to get as much done without any of you. I also want to thank the team for their late nights and hard work. Every one of them put so much effort and work into making sure we kept moving forward, and I'm really grateful. So... I'm June He, and I'm the co-lead with Brendan uh, for the Changemakers team. We all, on our team, we also have Sam, Toya, Nicolette, and Sophie. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge the work that the previous universities have done hey, as well. Hey, June He, the, for me, the sound the cut down a little bit. Can you turn it up, that oh, dial yeah. next to the button? Yeah, can you turn it up a little bit? Because of the groundwork and finding in Rights that some of the other schools have done. We drew inspiration from these four schools and their insights. Now to begin, we'll have Brendan introduce our personas. Awesome. So yeah, uh, there are two personas that we're going to be carrying throughout this presentation. One is Jane Smith. She's 18 and she's a senior in high school. And she kind of has an idea of what she wants to do. She's passionate about making impact around the topic of climate change, but she ultimately wants to gain more experience in the field of interest and is looking for some sort of mentorship. And our second persona is Robert Grant. He's a freshman who's 15, and he's not quite sure what he wants to do, but he definitely wants to get involved with his community and also make some connections along the way while he tries to find out what he's passionate about. Our how might we statement is, how might we create a digital space online accessible across the US and powerful enough to embolden high schoolers to collaborate and create change in their lives and the community around them. 
we decided to tackle these challenges head on with our Changemaker program. Our program is split into four phases, the introduction, collaboration and teamwork, presentation and scholarship. On the next few slides, Jane and Sarah will be demonstrating how the program would go. Hi, I'm Nicolette and I'll be role playing as Sarah, the DFA YMCA coordinator. Hi, I'm Sophie and I'll be role playing as Jane, a first time user. Hey Jane, thanks for checking out the Changemaker program. I'm Sarah and I'm on the DFA YMCA team. I'll be helping you navigate throughout our program. Hi Sarah, yeah, my friend introduced me to this program. She said that I would fit right in. Your friend's probably right. The Changemakers program allows for diverse sets of high schoolers to grow and learn with their like-minded peers, all while tackling a real life societal issue. That's exactly what I was looking for. Great. Let me send you the link so that you can learn more about it and sign up. Hi, Sarah, I just signed up. Perfect, Jane. You should receive a confirmation for signing up very soon. This is where you'll learn you'll be presented with your problem space that the project will revolve around, get grouped together with students that have similar interests as you, and where you'll attend the virtual kickoff event. The kickoff event would set the stage for what's to come throughout the next three days the agenda and spotlight the mentors of your group and other groups. These mentors are something that would be unique to this program because they're individuals with knowledge and expertise in the related problem spaces that are being offered. And they'll also be there to guide everyone throughout this journey. Who's your mentor? Whoa, look at all these mentors. My group got paired with Jessica Diaz. Wow, she seems like a really interesting person. And she's a mentor for climate change. Yeah, you should message or connect with her. Hey Jane, take a look through the event tab. Here you can access the agenda, other problem spaces being offered, information about the scholarship and more. Feel free to refer back to this whenever you want. Cool, I see that it starts on Thursday and I can start to work with my team that following weekend. Yep, you'll have the weekend to work on tackling your problem space. And then on Sunday, you'll present a slide deck of your group solution. Sounds good. I'm excited to meet my group members and work on this. After Jane has signed up and attended the virtual kickoff event, she'll be ready to move on to phase two, collaboration and teamwork. Phase two, collaboration and teamwork is the focal point of the Changemaker program. At this stage, Jane dives into thinking about potential solutions or areas of exploration for her group's topic and also where they'll be able to get feedback and guidance from their mentor. This is where their mentor would play a monumental role because these high school students might not have experience in creative problem solving or design thinking or anything along those lines due to their, due to their rigid high school curriculum. So this is where their mentor is there to validate their ideas, provide feedback and give them that extra push of confidence that they need to succeed. Our third phase consists of presentations. At the end of the three-day Changemaker program, Jane's group and the other groups involved are virtually presenting their ideas in the form of a slide deck presentation to a panel of judges. Ultimately, this allows Jane and other participants to have a tangible product at the end of the experience, which they could go on to use in their resumes, college applications, or continue on outside of the event. Our last phase is the most fun phase, which is a scholarship prizes. Based on the presentations given to the panel of judges, Jane's group places as one of the top groups and is awarded a scholarship. Given this is what incentivized some of her fellow teammates to sign up in the first place, they're all very content. Next, we'll be going over our insights and what we learned from our user interviews. Jane wanted to join this event because she thought it was a safe space to learn how she can be a change maker. Similarly enough, one of our YMCA participants also said that they want to be involved in this because it seemed like a great opportunity for them to learn how to gain insight on how to make change in their community. After talking to some people after the event is over, she finds out that almost everyone also found value and enjoyment in connecting and collaborating with others. In fact, in our user testing, we found that eight out of nine user participants in the YMCA group enjoy this event and would want to join it or recommend a friend. They felt that this would be a popular and useful event. Also, their favorite part about this was the collaboration aspect with their peers. They also liked that this event offers them extracurricular experiences as well as 
as a chance at a scholarship since they all wanted to apply for one later on. In the future, we plan to take the feedback we got from them and try to provide more guidance, resources, and time for our participants. Through the Change Makers programs, we address the how might we challenge and the insights from our user testing in four key aspects, sandbox, support, impetus, and growth. The Change Makers event works like a sandbox for students to collaborate, take risks, and lay the groundwork for actionable solutions in a safe space. Additionally, students working in the sandbox have access to mentors who provide insight, guidance, and inspiration to fully explore ideas and take initiative. Change Makers also provides the impetus for students to create change by providing financial aid for future career growth and lasting connections with like-minded individuals. Furthermore, through this event, students develop their communication, collaboration, leadership, and problem-solving skills that will give them the confidence to further pursue more change-making activities. The impact we're expecting are three things. Provide mentorship for youth to build their change-making tool set. Generate ideas and solutions that can be pursued further and put into communities. Get high schoolers ready for the next stage, thinking about college and careers. So here's a glimpse of some of the next steps that our team will be taking. In stage one, you can see that we felt it was important to get some further testing done. So we be believe that evaluative research, generative research, as well as behavioral metrics could be very beneficial for us to look into. In stage two, we want to take all this new data we've got and compare it to the current data that we have and therefore analyze it and refine our prototype in order to maximize the success of our event. Finally, in stage three, we plan to start actually setting up our event by setting up the website, finding and vetting mentors, as well as gathering resources for participants such as design tools and articles related to our prompts. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you for listening and joining us. Big round of applause for DFA UCSD and the Changemakers Project. Uh, so happy to see this, this work. Now I'd like to invite people to uh, line up in the virtual queue here so we can give them some additional feedback. Uh, Aileen, I don't know if that was before my comment in the chat, or was that the last team? Or Aileen, go for it. Yeah, this is for this, is for this team. This is okay. great. I, I actually coached on this project um, another semester. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was really interesting to see that what you guys did. And I really liked a lot. I love the idea of, um, first of all, just let me say, I thought your how can we statement was excellent because it was so specific and results oriented. Um, although I don't think how can we statements are necessarily supposed to be results oriented from what I understand, but still, I really like it. And I love the idea of mentors guiding um, community involvement. I think that's really important and that you understood your user journey so well. I would have loved to have seen some sort of a video example of part of this event, but I don't know how that how you would have done that, but it's just a thing I'd love to see. Um, I have a lot of questions though. Um, and I'm just gonna rattle them off and you might have answers to these that I just didn't see in your presentation, but something to consider, how are people selected to take part in the event? Can anybody do it or do you have to be chosen? Um, are the mentors volunteers? Are they paid? How are you gonna find these people? You know, Who's gonna be in charge of selecting them? How is the whole thing funded? Who's providing the scholarship money? And is the scholarship directed towards something? Like, is it a scholarship for further education? For further community involvement? Is it just a monetary award for participating? Um, that's, those are all my questions. But, um, but I, you know, easily, easily answerable, I think. And I thought that it was a, a great idea. And it'll be interesting to see if three days is actually long enough to accomplish what you guys want to do, want to do. I don't know if this is three full eight hour days or, you know, like a, almost like a, a virtual conference. Um, but but uh, good job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yep. Yeah, team, if you have a, a quick response, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts and then we can have William and, and then we can wrap up for uh, getting ready for the next half of this presentation. Um, in matters of the participants, we were just allowing any high schoolers to um, apply for the event on the what on our prototype you can see there's like a little sign up and we have like some requirements on the page itself um but that was just kind of skimmed over in the 
prototype on the slides. And then in matters of mentors, we're actually gonna find and vet them. And we're hoping to get some YMCA um, mentors as well as DFA and other possible sponsorships. So we'd have to look into that. So that would be like the next steps. And Oh, and as for the scholarship prizes, um, that was like a monetary um, incentive for people to sign, for high school students to sign up. But I think it would be actually interesting to see if we could maybe put that into terms of like provide making maybe for like their college um, education or something. Cause I think that'd be interesting. I think to quickly add on to that, um, I, a lot of, we're, right now, our plan is to continue this on for the next quarters, the next semester. And so I think a lot of the, the questions that you had, we haven't been able to discuss um, this quarter, but that's definitely something that uh, we should be and we will be discussing going forward. So thank you. William. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, UCSD. Great job on the presentation. Um, I... Uh, I, I worked with uh, the, the YMCA on a project uh, previously. It was the Lifeguard Recruitment and Retention Project. And, and it sounds like you were pulling from some of that stuff. Is that correct? Or am I making a false assumption? Um, I don't think we pulled from the Life Lifeguard um, Project. Okay. Okay. Um, so my, so my, uh, my observation is that uh, when we were going through that project, they uh, they really the, the things that we were talking about with the staff and then the, uh, the the lifeguards who are typically high school age to you know early college age students is that uh, this is actually a really important um, moment for mentorship as they're making that transition from high school to college. So I think you really nailed the purpose behind the project. Um, I, I think it might be useful then to try and plug into something more specific than just a gen general change maker type of event. So if there are more targeted things, like if the YMCA in your area has a particular type of initiative, if it's, you know, um, you know, whatever, the, whatever they're doing, I, I don't want to try and spin out examples, but uh, the YMCA has so many different areas that they're involved in. And I think it might be really helpful to now narrow and be very specific about how this program would work for targeted groups. And so like making change on climate or making change on, um, you know, some other type of social, uh, social need, you know, and, and equipping people to have those tools. I think it's really important. So, uh, so I encourage you to keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you so much for your feedback. Amazing. Okay, another round of applause for all of the teams, UCSD, Elon, and RISD Brown. Thank you so much for your presentations and your hard work this term. Give yourselves a pat on the back. Uh, critiquers, give yourselves a pat on the back for being here and supporting the teams. Uh, so now I want to, to capture this moment in the digital world forever. We're going to be doing a quick breakout group photo. So if you're able to turn your video on, if it's not already on, uh, that would be great so we can see everybody. Uh, if, if you don't have the capacity, that's okay, but just get ready, you know, envision, you know, the smile you're going to make, whatever you're going to be doing with your hands, just take that minute, get ready for the photo. And on the count of three, uh, we're going to say DFA. So one, two, three, DFA, and we'll take the photo. We'll do two photos. So ready? One, two, three, DFA. Cool. And last one, one, two, three, DFA. Amazing. Okay, uh, so thank you so much for, for doing, uh, uh, like feeding my Northwestern or Midwest, you know, family habit of taking photos of every occasion more than you ever need. Uh, and so what we're gonna be doing next, so we're gonna go take a break. We're gonna do a five minute break. We're gonna regroup uh, with the other team and we're gonna be hearing lightning talks from Adam uh, Wheeler and Ruby, who is on the call here, will be presenting in it, uh, with with Izzy. So uh, go stretch, look up this at the ceiling, not at your computer for a minute, and come back in five minutes. We'll be in that main uh, breakout group. So we'll see you then. So it is my pleasure to introduce our first presentation from Adam Wheeler. He is the global manager of social innovation at Steelcase and a former executive coach, uh, education coach at the Stanford D School. 
Uh, Adam has been an amazing partner with, with DFA and I've had the joy of working with him on previous national challenges. The UIUC team on the call has been taking on the Steelcase Challenge, uh, focus on empowering the future of work, worker and workplace. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to hearing from Adam, who always comes with so many amazing thoughts and ideas and the sense of wonder in, in his work. So uh, everyone, please give a big virtual round of applause for Adam Wheeler. Hi, everybody. Ross, real quick, are you going to share the slides and then do you just want me to tell you to advance them or could, do I have the ability to share my screen? Oh, yeah, I got it right here. Perfect. Jamming on it. Okay, could I get a thumbs up if you can see this? All right. Um, so what I wanted to do is, is maybe take a little bit different of approach um, in what I talk about today in that uh, I wanted to talk about how you're being. Um, when I was in your shoes, I think an aspiration that I had for my career was that eventually I would get to a steady state right? It's like, there is a perfect steady state where it's like, oh, when I get there, then I'll be okay. Or when I get there, then I'll be okay. Or when I get there, no, th then I'll be okay. Um, but the reality is that we're in this constant process of becoming. And so in the midst of being where you are right now, the, pr the approach that you're taking is going to continue to shape who you are far into the future. And so what I wanted to do is share a little bit of my story and a tool, a couple of the tools that have been really helpful for me in just acknowledging this process of becoming. Um, so I had grown up in rural Iowa uh, in a small town of uh, 3,000 people. And when I was in college, I moved to Chicago um, where I became, instead of uh, one of 99.9% .9 white kids, I was like the only white kid on the bus. And it was this beautiful moment of deconstruction where all of these ideas that I had about what it meant to be a person or to be uh, a, a designer were, were radically in tension with this new world that I, that I was observing. Um, and the reality is, and just like with your design process, if you're attempting to solve a problem that the problem, anytime we try to solve a problem, we sort of solve it from the model that we have in our mind. Um, so we solve it as we understand it, not as it actually is in the world. So if, if you're trying to change a world that doesn't exist, the revolutionary of your uh, potential of your idea doesn't either. And so this big question is, in my process of becoming, how am, I, how am I shedding my conceptions of the world in order to understand what actually is? Um, and so that's where these notebooks come into play. Um, so in Chicago, as I had moved, all of a sudden it was like all of these new ideas, these uh, conflicting tensions, uh, things that I thought were threatening, I was being surrounded by. And I needed a sort of safe place to uh, have faith or doubt or figure it out. And so little black moleskins became this sanctuary for me to figure out how the world worked and how I worked and what my pains were and what my passions were. Um, and so just over the years, filling up tens of them, dozens of them, twenties of them, thirties of them, uh, and what I wanted to talk about specifically here was this notion of like, there's, there's this idea that our pains can be very connected to our passions. Um, and so as I was going through this process of becoming, there were so many things that I had felt really frustrated with my own experience, not knowing or understanding how the world is or how to permeate it. I knew that I, I wanted to do something creative. I wanted to be a designer, but I didn't have those resources in my area in order to like permeate that world. And so a passion that stemmed out of this was how do I help high school students who might feel that same way uh, have more access to a world that I didn't know anything about? Um, not that that's a great human-centered design process because you are not your user, but this was me trying to figure out how do I impact a world in a way that felt authentic to me. Um, 
we had started this, I was a, a youth director at, at a neighborhood center and we had started after school programs um, focused on English and math tutoring. We had, uh, there was culinary stuff involved that led into a summer camp, this idea of how do you make a safe place for students to understand the world. Um, and what birthed out of this was a program called Ambrose. Uh, it was a, and here you can see in the background, I don't know if you can see like uh, Cassidy, this is one of our students. She was wearing this t-shirt that had this sort of like make it honest graphic on it. Um, what we, one of the things was how do we not become just inheritors of the world or culture that other people are producing, but how do we teach high school students to be active producers of the culture that they want to see happen in the world. So uh, out of this summer camp came an after school program that blended the creative side of business and the business side of creativity. We hosted workshops in graphic design, illustration, uh, digital filmmaking, screen printing, songwriting and recording arts. We did, uh, we invited guest artists, some who are now um, direct art directors at Patagonia um, or working for the Bull, like working for the Chicago Bulls or working with interesting uh, global magazines just happened to be uh, cohorts and friends. And so we made uh, t-shirts together with these students and sold them as subscriptions. The whole idea was, could we create this sort of self-funded after-school creative community? Um, additionally, we started recruiting different uh, political stakeholders. This was the, the mayor of our town. Um, and we had hosted this thing called the Cardboard Regatta that was all about sort of like it was a little bit of STEM. We work with Tiara Yachts, who's a yacht manufacturer here in our community um, and a large cardboard manufacturer to host this, uh, design a boat in three hours and then race it against others. Um, sort of this interesting mixture of like, how do you do creative stuff and how do you build community that's authentic? Meanwhile, all this is happening. Um, my relationship with my partner was like totally disintegrating. Uh, I felt so alive professionally because it, there was this wild convergence of like, man, we're helping kids, we're making cool shit, we're putting like wild stuff out in the world, we're hosting these like uh, live immersive art concerts like at our space. Um, uh, meanwhile, this thing that I had found so valuable was disintegrating. And there came to be this moment where you ask the question like, and if you tilt your head sideways, you might be able to see it. Is your existence good for the world? And is your existence good for yourself? Uh, and this was a sort of like reckoning, whereas as much as I was doing that was feeling really exciting, it was also totally eroding a component of my world that was really important to me. Um, it was here uh, that, figuring out like what are the next steps that we need to do um our business we so we were doing design and screen sorry i want to check my time right now um uh, ross can you give me like a two minute warning when it's are we three minutes right now two minutes zero yeah, minutes yeah. uh three more minutes okay um so one of the things that had happened was uh we we were really good at doing the sort of like business side and we were trying we were like a business trying to be an after school program Meanwhile, down the road at this place called Wimcat, they had a robust after school program. They were awarded one of the top 12 after school uh, programs in the nation uh, back in 2015. Um, and they were looking to start a social enterprise. And so in this serendipitous sort of moment, um, Wimcat actually acquired our our social effort. Um, and it became this program that was a mixture of sort of like uh, process mentoring, production, um, live events, and all of which we were working with high school students who knew they wanted to go to college, didn't know what they wanted to do, so they would uh, earn it, they would get a job in our little graphic design and screen printing place while they were going to school. Totally awesome. Out of this emerged uh, a new idea of like, what if you could reimagine uh, what a freshman year looked like. A lot of our students uh, weren't in places where they could afford student loans, where that was super intimidated. Um, so we created a program called Step Year. The idea behind Step Year was a gradual step that allowed you to explore different types of 
uh, college pathways, different types of career pathways, et cetera, while you were earning, uh, earning money in, in Ambrose. Um, and that was like, has gone through a series of iterations, but it's cool to see that program still in existence. Um, another project that then was birthed out of this sort of uh, 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 transition into WimCat was this idea of, actually, I'm gonna pause here. We launched a couple of other uh, social enterprises at WimCat. Um, and now what I wanted to talk about is this interesting sort of like role at Steelcase. So I'm the global manager of social innovation. We just have launched uh, an initiative called the Equity and Education Challenge. Um, and we were lucky enough to have almost 380 people from 30 different countries sign up for this. Um, the idea is, can we create a community of learners who are attempting to make their, their learning environments, whether they be in classroom or out of classroom or in schools or in communities, more equitable and more he and healthier. We have a wide body of research that's just coming out around well-being's impact on the classroom. Um, and it's been really fun to see uh, uh, the space that we're creating is allowing these educators to come in, to share with each other, to create um, and we're actually going to fund 15 interesting projects this spring in a fellowship. All of this to say is if you would have told me as a 20 year old designer who wanted to change the world that didn't know how that you would be uh, leading a project at a company like Steelcase that's making this kind of impact, I would have been like, what dude, what is the, what is the pathway to get there? Uh, and it feels serendipitous. But the only way that I can say is looking in, looking in hindsight is coming back to that first slide of making it honest, is that yet each one of those instances, when there were decisions to be made, I was honest with myself about what I needed. I was honest, uh, attempting to be as honest as possible about like what I could actually execute and where I needed others. And then the other is just like doing the best that you can to make interesting stuff and put it in the world in a healthy way. And I think an interesting byproduct of that has been the sort of creative communities that have happened both at Ambrose and at WimCat with Stepier and with Public Agency, and now at Steelcase in the social innovation department as we're attempting to make a difference. Um, but, but all of that while I felt like I was wandering. And in hindsight, it's become pretty clear that, that like the idea of like, how do you make a community of craftspeople developing their individual talents, but collaborating for the greater good, greater good of society. Uh, that sort of like has been this weird red thread in my work that's that's only emerged now as like a 39 year old looking back in, in hindsight. So my encouragement to you as you're on this, uh, the precipice of whatever is what's next is that you would make it honest uh, and be honest with yourself about what's good for you and what's good for the world. So with that, I want to say thank you for being here and keep up the good work, DFA. Uh, so up next, our second act shifting gears. I'm excited to introduce everyone to Ruby McCafferty. And I have now your name in front of me <laughs> to pronounce it to the proper you know, alliteration that is needed. Um, Ruby is currently a design researcher at IBM and is an alumni from the DFA Northwestern studio. And um, Ruby has been able to join us in all of the crits uh, this, this term and has been a really active alumni. And so we're looking forward, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing uh, from Ruby today. Ruby, feel free to take it away. Okay, um, I am going to share my screen. I am not as experienced with Zoom, so please bear with me. I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> um, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. We're gonna do it. Sorry. Also, my dog is feeling very clingy right now. Okay. Is that the right thing? It is. Okay. Beautiful. Amazing. Fantastic. Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about um, designing with autonomy in a corporate job. So Izzy, who was, she was originally going to do this presentation with me. She had something that she had to go to, but so this is very, very much a co-creation from the two of us. We kind of just sat down and thought about um, what some valuable advice or insight would be for people who were, you know, in college, leaving college, starting to think about what they might be doing after school. Um, Izzy and I, let's see, I'm going to the next slide. So Izzy and I, I um, both work 
um, at IBM Studios Poughkeepsie, so in upstate New York. I'm actually currently in um, Los Angeles. Um, sorry, <laughs> currently in Los Angeles, and Izzy is currently in um, Chicago, but we're both um, in that studio. Um, we worked together for like the first year, but Izzy um, joined, I guess, a year before me. So she's a little bit senior to all of this. Um, we're both really involved in the design thinking practice um, at IBM as well. So we just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of like the process of adjusting from college and the experience of designing um, really closely with other students, designing in an environment like DFA and kind of how that transition happens um, to, yeah, designing in a more corporate setting, specifically like IBM for us is, it's really design focused, but it's also really business focused. And that was something that we had to adjust to a lot. So first, before I talk about that, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about IBM culture. So IBM culture 101, so design is relatively new to the company's history. So there was a really strong element of design that existed mm, about like 50 years ago, 50 or 60 years ago, there was some incredible designers that were a part of IBM's history, but only recently has it been re-implemented as like a central tenant to the business. Um, so that is something that is really key to remember in all of this, that even though IBM design has a really strong brand, has a really strong structure, it is still relatively new to you know, the whole process, there are a lot of people who are not designers, there are a lot of people who are not familiar with design, um, there are a lot of people who are scared of design. Um, and so all of these resources are in service of coaching designers, but it's also, they're also in service of kind of bringing everyone else into the design realm as well. So there's a ton of structure and resources. We have these like fantastic field guides, um, for design thinking. I have one that sits on my desk all the time um, that I use a lot. Um, we have, you know, really strong structures for carbon design. We have, you know, different badging systems where you can get, you know, certifications to become, you know, a design coach or a design advocate or, you know, things like that. We also have a really strong structure of, you know, kind of this boot camp training that you go through when you first join IBM to kind of learn about all of IBM design and kind of how our, your practices are meant to fit into this overall structure. So at first glance, it's like a really, really structured environment, which, you know, for me, when I came into this, I was a little intimidated by that because for me, design has always been, you know, really fluid. It's always been kind of just about, you know, engaging with people and, a little bit of like going where the wind takes you. Um, and it felt a little weird to be in this environment where um, there were so many rules. And so we, I kind of like have been on this journey for the past year and a half of finding that flexibility and autonomy in the structure and in IBM's design work overall. So, that has been the key over my like past year and a half and for Izzy as well, finding the balance and maintaining autonomy in the pace of the corporate world. So a couple of like, pointers that we came up with. So the first thing that I think is really key is to not rush judgment. So this can really lead to a lot of unwarranted frustration. Like when you, um, I think like when I first joined, I was like, what is going on? <laughs> like, why are there all these rules? Um, it was really difficult to adjust. So really like taking the time to meter yourself and adjusting, adjust to those new environments. So really learning about, you know, your environment, your project, the people that you're working with and taking that time to engage with them without judgment is super, super crucial. Um, also like, the idea of kind of switching between slow and fast paced environments. Like I came from Northwestern, it's on a quarter system. Everything happens in like 10 week increments. It's like super, super fast paced. Um, and so I am now on a project that has a two year product cycle, which is super, super different. Um, so learning how to switch between those slow and fast environments is really important. Um, also the idea of like project topics and domains not always being to your liking. You don't have the freedom necessarily to choose 
which products you're going to be on, which projects you don't, you know, necessarily get to pick the things that you are super interested in. But there are two pieces of advice there. One is to stand up for yourself if you see something that you're really interested in um, and jump on it because that's not always going to come up. But also, you know, if you are on a project, projects that you don't love and this honestly might happen to some of you right now with your DFA projects like the projects is going to continue onwards whether you're interested in it or not so you can either choose to become invested and find a part of it that you really enjoy and make a big impact or you know let your lack of interest take over and drive the way that you are engaging with the project um and a key to all of this has really been like autonomy through balance. So finding design allies and advocates is like very, very key um, here. So just continuing to engage with people, um, finding the people who are like built in friends for you. So for me, that meant like my design cohort, um, the studio, different guilds and clubs that we have at IBM, and also just continuing to engage with IBM's design history. So knowing that you have this, um, history and the structure behind you has actually been really key in developing that confidence and autonomy that's needed. Um, next, like building on that confidence and building a toolkit. So we have like toolkits like this, but um, also just equipping yourself to handle the nuance of your environment. So building up a lot of different, you know, design activities that you can pull out when you need or like, learning about different environments that you might be a part of is really important. Like I took it upon myself in my first year to just do as many design workshops as I possibly could. And I got to know this huge wide range of people that work at IBM um, and how to talk about design with each one of them. And that really has been key in giving me the confidence to lead and design autonomously in an environment that otherwise is a little bit scary. Um, okay, <laughs> sorry, the, the very quick presentation, um, but please reach out to Izzy or I, we are like more than happy to talk with you about design at IBM, we're more than happy to talk to you about just design in general, um, our emails are there, connect with us on LinkedIn, whatever you want, and then also there's like a ton of resources out there for IBM design, especially right now, like all of the IBM design courses and badges are free, which is amazing, so you can complete those and um, get some like just different insight on what design can look like in different environments. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's really been wonderful talking with all of you today and I'm excited to hear your thoughts. Big round of applause for Ruby and Izzy. Thank you so much for putting all this work into the presentation for sharing it with us. I think you've hit on a lot of uh, topics that students and anyone who's been uh, a former student or whoever has done any work has, has, has wanted to explore. So uh, we're going to go into new breakout rooms and connect with people and, and talk a little bit more around, have you ever experienced this? You know, what are you looking forward uh, uh, as, we're, as we go into our, our futures and uh, is what can we take away from this presentation doing so? So Alden, 